I am very pleased to uh, serve as the host for this, uh, for this great yeah. panel. Uh, but as some of you know, John Bryan asked, and you have to say yes. So I'm not sure I had an option in this somewhere along the way. Uh, I'm honored to be joined by uh, two great leaders and good friends, Tessa Stelling, Chairman and CEO of Sonovas, and Dan Cathy, Chairman and President and CEO of Chick-fil-A. Uh, what a great group. I mean, this is a, a, an ideal time to have a forum such as this. If you think about all the issues that are going on right now in the world, shouldn't we be having a conference on hope? I mean, that's exactly what we should be doing. What are we going to call that? And certainly for myself, that's why I'm so happy to, uh, to be here. Uh, now, for SunTrust, uh, the work of Operation Hope is totally aligned with everything we stand for as a company. Uh, we define our purpose of our company as lighting the way to financial well-being. Uh, SunTrust has been partnering with Operation Hope uh, for, for quite a few years, beginning with uh, the investment here at, uh, at, at Ebenezer. And we thought, what a great place to start in Atlanta, and what a great place to begin our, begin our partnership. Uh, we now have four Hope Inside branches, uh, and I'm very pleased, thank you. This might get you more excited, though, because I'm pleased to report that we're donating an additional million dollar grant over the next two years. To uh, so Hope Inside and to Hope Inside Plus to make sure that that, uh, that, that vision continues. Um, but today also, uh, and maybe actually to outdo SunTrust, I'm not sure it's Kessel Stelling and Sonovas announced their partnership with Operation Hope and to join the Hope Inside program. So Kessel, thank you for your uh, I know that Kessel has a shared belief in that correlation between strong community and strong bank. Uh, and Sonovas has certainly got an incredibly rich history in virtually everything to do with uh, the communities that they serve in. Kessel is a board member along with me of the Financial Services Roundtable. He's also in the Georgia Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and he personally commits at, at all sorts of levels of uh, uh, in education, uh, including right now serving as the Vice Chairman for the uh, 6th Congressional District of the University of Georgia Board of Board Regents. So, Kessel, thank you so much for, for joining this panel. Uh, Dan Cathy, uh, what can you say? Um, Dan, you have, uh, uh, you have led a company that virtually everybody in this room is uh, uh, is jealous of. Uh, when I uh, when I left today, uh, my assistant I thought would say good luck, do well. Uh, you know, I'm by, behind you. And what she said is, I love Dan Kathy. <laughs> uh, your uh, commitment to financial empowerment and entrepreneurship is, is literally unsurpassed. Uh, we have the great luxury of working with uh, Chick-fil-A on the Chick-fil-A Discovery Center here in Atlanta, which brings 30,000 young people, middle, middle school students a year, to complete a required uh, curriculum on financial education. And it was really Dan and Chick-fil-A's leadership that, uh, that put that underway, and it has set a mark that's really unsurpassed in, uh, in the rest of this country. Dan also made me break a promise that I made publicly. Uh, we were on a panel together, uh, and he so uh, usurped me in virtually everything. I promised I would never serve on a panel with him again, and look where I am. So I just, just couldn't help myself. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn the podium over to, uh, to our moderator for this session. Many of you know Diane Brady from uh, Bloomberg Business Week. She's certainly been a great friend of, uh, of this organization. Uh, she recently wrote a very insightful piece, which I would encourage you to read, uh, on John O'Brien's last book, uh, How the Poor Can Save Capitalism. Uh, uh, she had a very you know, unique and appropriate perspective. Uh, she's uh, volunteered to put us a little bit on the hot seat, uh, and uh, in, in a good way. I don't know what that means. So, Diane, uh, please take over the helm.
decided to write my notes on my son's old cell phone bill from last month as a humbling reminder of the importance of understanding the language of money. So, um, so you are fresh for me lecturing him on overage charges. Here, wait, wait, we have a guest in the house. Hello, John, how are you? Hello. I'm out of the program. Um, slightly. We have a little surprise. Bankers don't like surprises. <laughs> so you really have to just do it, because if you tell them about it, they'll tell you 20 reasons why it won't work. This banker's a little strange. He actually had 20 reasons why this idea would work. The idea was bold, audacious. It was to go back to our founding. Abraham Lincoln, March 3rd, 1865. After the Civil War and after the Emancipation Proclamation. Called for the creation of a Freedmen's Bank. It's a piece of history nobody knows. Part of the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bank was chartered by Abraham Lincoln, arguably one of the best presidents we've ever had, to teach free slaves about money. Lincoln was killed five weeks later. The bank was stood up because it was legislatively enacted, but without leadership, it began to flounder. It was, a, it was located actually across the street from the, from the White House, across from the Treasury, and was now the Treasury Annex today. Frederick Douglass tried to run this bank, even put up $10,000 of his own money in it, trying to save it. And when it failed, he said the failure of this bank did more to set free slaves back than 10 more years of slavery. Pop your fingers 100 years past. Here comes the icon. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and my mentor, Ambassador Andrew Young, and their Poor People's Campaign. Dr. King gets killed two weeks before the first march of Washington of the Poor People's Campaign. And once again, the division gets damaged. It's not like poor people and struggling folks and those who are in the teetering class, folks who got too much month at the end of their money. Can I get an amen? <laughs> By the way, that's not a black issue, a white issue, a brown issue. Whether you're white, black, red, brown, or yellow, you want to see some more green. It's not like we gave this memo, Ms. Brady, to five billion people on the planet and they screwed it up. They never got the memo. Mm. So I started dreaming about the creation of a modern Freedmen's Bank. I started dreaming about hope inside. Hope inside of bank branches. There's 100,000 bank branches, underutilized. Hope inside of grocery stores, big box retailers, credit unions, government offices. We put the first in Ebenezer Church, Steve Bartlett, and Tim Pawlenty called a bunch of CEOs, but the first bank to stand up and said, we'll give the first million dollars with SunTrust Bank. That's great. <laughs> but then I said, I want more, more than one location. I want a thousand locations. I actually originally said a hundred locations, and Joe's body of one West Bank said one out of a thousand. A thousand locations in bank branches. But I needed some credibility. I needed somebody to step up first and say, I will back you. And it couldn't be the Homeboy Shopping Network. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it had to be a real bank that people would take seriously. Bill Rogers is considered to be a button-down, straight-laced, no-nonsense banker. You don't play with Bill Rogers. But Bill Rogers stood up and changed the mandate of his bank of lighting the way to financial well-being, not the mission statement, the whole statement of his bank. And Bill Rogers not only put up the first million dollars, then another million dollars, then two more million dollars, not only put up five million dollars, and not only opening and operating ten hope and sides today, Bill Rogers stood in front of an entire industry and said, it's not about me, it's not about SunTrust, we have got to do this because it's good for banking, it's good for America. This man is the reason we have opened a hundred locations in the first year of 2014. I am giving Bill Rogers.